Now, the process of building a neural network, showing it lots of examples, having it train on those examples, means that if we show it examples of um, certain um, objects or text or, or bits of voice that relate to certain subpopulations, then we introduce bias. So, for example, if I show it all images of um, male, white males, and train it to detect whether or not they're smiling or frowning, being happy or sad, and then I use that model with someone that isn't a white male, part of the training to detect whether or not it's happy or sad may also incorporate features related to being male and being um, white. So we need to be careful that we don't introduce bias. If we then show it a picture of a female, part of its training might have been to detect um, the shape of the hair when we smile versus when we frown. And we didn't intend it to that, we intended it to train on the mouth shape. But because the hair line might have been moving, it may have also trained on that. Now with women's hairlines being different to males, normally, then there may have been some bias introduced in our training so that when a woman uses the model, um, because of their hair shape being different, it would then give different results than on the population that we trained it on, just as an example. Now, it becomes more significant, say, if we train it on a whole lot of Caucasian uh, people, males and females, but then someone from another race is then used in the model and it may detect things differently. So we want to have our models trained on as much of the population that are going to be using the model as possible. But of course, there is also bias in a lot of other areas of our society, such as in text. Now, a lot of our large language models, for example, are being trained off text from the internet. Now, that would be fine if the text on the internet was all unbiased, but there's already bias inherent in what's on the internet. Uh, probably 90% of it is generated by Western countries, um, generally generated by more academic and also liberal um, orientated um, political views. So there's a whole range of bias introduced by where the population of data is gathered from. Now, in human relations, we have bias all the time. There's over 50 types of bias that have been identified. And I'm giving you a list of those. Um, from self-serving bias, where we in unconsciously seek to benefit ourselves rather than others in making decisions, um, false consensus bias. Um, there's a whole range of them. We'll discuss these in the tutorial. So have a look through that list and think about the sorts of bias that you have. When you make decisions, um, be it with your students or any decision that you might make, which of these biases might be affecting you in how you go about coming up with an unbiased decision. Now, this is part of the reasons why we have very highly trained judges in our society, because it's very difficult to make unbiased decisions. And we train specialized people to be able to try to do that in legal situations. But there's always going to be bias introduced in any decision-making process. We try to mitigate that, we try to reduce that bias, and in research, we try to do that so that we can give a, an accurate um, representation of the research question we're trying to explore. But there is always going to be some level of bias. Now, when it comes to um, training computer systems, introducing that bias that's inherent in any situation into a computer model has its own problems because that computer model is going to be used to make decisions. Now, while a human being might make decisions and it might be pointed out to them that they're uh, being biased and then they can adjust that, um, when a computer system is being trained, if we don't recognize that there is bias 
potentially being trained into the system, it's going to be much harder to reverse that later on, or even to detect that that bias is affecting the decisions being made. Now, there's always going to be bias in any system, a human system or computer system. What we want to try to do is to minimize that bias. So to reduce the bias to an acceptable level where it's not impacting adversely on the decisions being made in the system. And that's what we do in our training processes. Now, there are two types of model bias or bias in our computer systems. The model bias, which is inherent in the statistical structure of how we've constructed our neural networks um, and the relationship between those. That sort of bias we can train and improve over time. And um, generally, as our neural network systems are used more in society, we learn about um, this sort of model bias and we can reduce it. More complex is the societal bias. So while model bias has two main elements, the inaccurate infrastructure, so it's not looking back enough um, enough previous stages, say in our current transformer models, where it looks back at a hundred different decision points in making its new decision point. If we can look back at a thousand previous decision points, that's going to be a better um, system, going to be less likely to have bias from the model itself than if we only look back a few dozen um, decision points. And then there's underfitting, where we train the model um, but the model hasn't been trained enough to identify one of those outliers. So um, if the model is well trained, all decision making points will have been trained and be accurate as far as the model goes in coming up with its decisions. Where the model hasn't been trained accurately and there are still large gaps in terms of its function, um, in relation to the input that it's currently making decisions on, it's going to make a guess. And this is where we see hallucinations in our large language models, where it has to make a guess because it's going to come up with a decision. Um, it's just whether or not that decision is accurate in terms of the model, in terms of the data that's being fed into it, or it's wildly inaccurate, depends upon how much data related to that decision is in the system. Um, if you ask it a very esoteric question that it doesn't have much data to go on, it's going to make a guess um, and it could be wildly inaccurate. The more data related to the question that you are asking that it has been trained on, the more likely that that is going to be an accurate guess. Um, it's going to fit the data. If there's very little data, then it's going to be much more, much less accurate. And then we have societal bias. This is related to all the 50 types of biases that we've just looked at. So in societal bias, there is bias in the training data, where, for example, we trained it on a whole lot of um, political views from a particular perspective. And if someone is using it to ask questions about politics, it's going to present um, an answer that is related to the political perspective that it's been trained on. There's unrepresentative bias, where we talked a bit about before, um, we ask it to detect someone that's related to um, femaleness, where it's only been tra trained on male images or different ethnicities or whatever else it might be trained on. If, you, using, if you've trained it on detecting cats and dogs, and you introduce a ferret, it's going to look at the features of the ferret and work out whether or not it's more likely a cat or more likely a dog. Um, that would have been better to train it on pictures of ferrets as well, so that it could make a much more informed decision as to whether or not it is a ferret, a cat or a dog, rather than having to make a guess based upon the properties it um, knows about cats and dogs. And then there's just all of those other societal biases that we need to think about when we train our models and try to reduce as best we can 
um, in collecting the data and putting the data into the system, but also on retraining. Remember that back propagation where we identify whether or not it's been effective or ineffective? That process of retraining our models can over time reduce bias because we're going to be giving it um, indications as whether or not the model is being successful or unsuccessful. And as long as there's not bias in that decision-making process, um, over time, the model will improve itself without us necessarily having to worry about the input bias. Okay, so as an example of bias and how it can affect decisions in a real-life situation, we're going to take a common example of recruiting, where we're making decisions as to whether or not to employ someone based upon their resumes. And I've got a little computer game for you to play called Survival of the Best Fit, where you're going to be presented with um, resumes and you, you'll make decisions as to whether or not you'll employ someone or not employ them. Very simplified resumes, I, I might add. But the process of doing this will help you see the different types of bias that can be trained into a system but also how we can try to mitigate against that bias. Um, there are a range of strategies for mitigation, and you are going to need to apply some of these strategies or talk about how you would attempt to apply them for your own chat-based system. Now, there are a range of approaches you can take to try to mitigate bias. Um, it comes down to two main categories. Um, there's individual fairness, where you're trying to ensure that um, there is fairness for the individuals that are impacted by the decisions made in your model. Now, there's two approaches to this. There's the fair representation, where you train your model so that it um, makes decisions upon a representative population uh, that are represented in your model. Um, so, for example, I give is around university admissions and you want to have them um, decisions being made fair so that no one group is biased so that they are disadvantaged in their applications to enter into university, be that by their ethnicity, their gender or whatever other um, mechanism there might be. So fair representation is ensuring that you train your model so that it is representative of all the possible applicants that wish to apply for uni university. Now you may not train it, for example, to anticipate that artificial intelligence might want to apply to go to the university. So you would have biased your training model against AIs applying. So you wouldn't have considered that. So you wouldn't have included that in the training model, just as you might not consider um, various other factors that might um, be in place. Say uh, blind, someone that's blind wanting to attend university, you hadn't considered that in your training model. So you hadn't built that into the processes and it may then be inherently unfair to them when they go to apply. Now, there's also constrained optimization. This is where we don't necessarily want to be purely fair. Um, there are instances where we want to actually introduce bias, essentially. So for example, we want to make sure that equal numbers of males and females attend the university. Um, so we can introduce uh, groupings so that in our training model, it will ensure that, yes, everyone's got an equal chance, but there's also um, an overall allocation process whereby we want to um, ensure that there is a representation across various groupings. Um, and the models can be trained to support that. Now, this leads us into the concept of group fairness. Now, 
this is essentially adjusted um, by the bias weightings in our models. And we have reweighting, post-processing and pre-processing approaches. So reweighting is where we identify biases or we want to introduce biases. Um, and we go in and we adjust the individual weightings in the model. That's quite complex. It's often done through a retraining process rather than a specifically adjusting the weightings mathematically. But it's a process of going in and identifying where a bias exists and then training the model to remove that bias. There's also post-processing. This is where um, we've identified that biases exist and we again go through the process of trying to adjust the model in terms of its outputs. Um, so while reweighting adjusts the model in terms of the weightings within the model, uh, in terms of the decision making processes within the model, post processing looks at the model in terms of its outputs, how many, um, say, different racial groups are being accepted into the university based upon the percentage of input of uh, racial groups applying for the university. And we can then try to adjust the model, particularly in terms of its outputs, based upon that understanding of whether or not bias has been introduced. The final approach is on pre-processing. Now, this is looking at the data we're using to train our model and trying to remove the bias within that data. So, for example, I give it around um, teacher evaluations. The fact um, of someone's age may not be something that we want to train the model to consider in making its decisions. So we wouldn't include teacher's age in the training data. So then we wouldn't have the bias around age being introduced. Likewise, we might decide not to introduce gender in the training data and have the model trained um, without taking that into consideration. So that's the concept of pre-processing. Now, all of this bias um, identification and amelioration processes come down to two philosophical perspectives. The first is that we're all equal and that we should be treated equally regardless. Um, we try to minimize bias and get rid of any bias and the system will make decisions fairly and equally. The other is accepting that there are certain situations when we want to have bias. We want to actually um, address other bigger issues, such as a gender inequality. We know that gender inequality exists. We're using a particular system to help address that by um, ensuring that an equal number of males and females are admitted into a program, for example. Even though, in the, as a um, theoretical example, say there were 70% more qualified males and only 30% qualified females, we would still introduce a bias into the system so that we would end up having 50% males and 50% females introduced into the system in order to address larger societal issues. So that's the what you see is what you get sort of philosophical perspective. So in training your models for your ch chat system, you need to consider these various mechanisms of or various types of bias and various mechanisms that can be put into place to try to mitigate bias. Now, you won't have an awful lot of capacity to actually do the mitigation, but in your um, the portfolio assessment task, you will talk about how you would attempt to go about mitigating biases, identifying what biases may exist, and some of the approaches that can be taken to mitigate that. And we'll discuss this further in the tutorial.